I met Warren uh, here recently at an EWA conference, and I didn't know Warren. I hadn't met him before, but um, I think that we are kindred spirits. Um, he tends to be a wee bit confrontational, um, and he's a bit contrarian, and he likes to um, address things that are difficult to address. He has a huge amount of experience in the world of wildlife uh, here in Texas. He's been involved with Texas Animal Health Commission, the USDA. He is involved with the drug that we use, BAM, uh, for capture. Um, he's done work with um, CWD and just lots and lots and lots of stuff. He, is a, he was a game warden, I believe, for 25 years. Um, so Warren is gonna talk to us about the past um, the present and what the future of wildlife looks like here in Texas, as well as the associated regulations and the potential challenges that we're facing from a regulatory standpoint. So with that, I'd like to welcome Warren. Thank you, sir. Do you want this or this? this. There you go. Well, good evening. Thank you. So I've got a stopwatch. I'm going to do my due diligence. And um, they told me I had about two hours so you guys try to relax and first I want to welcome you here and tell you uh, it's a privilege for me to be here today and you're going to hear the other side of the story from me but I think it's an important message and an important story for you to hear if you notice you're going to see as I travel through my presentation I like to give images that stir memories and so if you look at the first one it's a road, and one might think it's just a road with pretty scenery, but it, as you're going to find as we move through this program, I want to challenge you to every slide that you see first, think about what that slide means to you, because there's a meaning behind every one of them, and I'm going to try to go through about 45 years of experience in about 50 minutes for you, but I... There's a couple of things I really, really want to hone in on today that I feel very important for this industry, and you might agree or disagree to me, but I will tell you, I made a statement one time in 1998 to a group of deer enthusiasts of something that I thought could ruin our business, and one was government, and the other one was disease, and so that doesn't mean one could be worse than the other one or one has a fault over the other one, but there's two things that are gonna happen. Government doesn't always understand, and disease has no barriers except from perception and what we do and how we interact with wildlife, because you're beginning to hear it more and more and more about epidemiologically how wildlife has the ability to transfer something possibly to humans and our humans to wildlife and you're gonna see more of it. If you think COVID was, it's gone, there will be another one. And y'all are gonna be sitting right in the middle of this, all of us are, on these animals we deal with. So remember the two things that can get in the way of our business, because Brian said something earlier that really is, we're, we're headed up the pinnacle right now at this industry. It's viable, it has a meaning, but there's another side of the seesaw so let's start through, and I'm going to take you on a magic carpet ride through the, the countryside and let you see what some things actually that are going on that you may not be aware of. And so help me with, uh, there it is. So why in the world would I have picked a circus slide for the first one that we're going to look at? So y'all think about that a minute. But I would tell you, I live in a world sometimes where I'm testifying or I see regulations and all of a sudden after two or three hours, I think I'm in a circus because I've got people all around me that don't know or don't understand or can't apply to what we're doing, as Brian mentioned early on. That's one of the biggest dangers we've got. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, one of my pet peeves before we get started, whether you agree or disagree, is images on social media and in ads and perceptions of what we deal with. Because when you walk out of this room, whether it's someone that's working as a concierge, a check-in, a cab driver, a gas station attendant, so many of them have no idea what you do. But I can tell you what they don't want. They don't want you hurting animals. 
inside their head. They don't want animals hurt. I work with activists every single day of my job. Every day I work with activists. And I have to learn how to negotiate with them as we're all going to have to learn about certain things. And that's a, a meaningless slide, except that that's a contract. And I want to encourage all of you in here that if you haven't thought about contracts, if you haven't thought about what it means to have someone understand what you're doing with them, or why you're doing it, or what your intent is, you need to start thinking about contracts if you're not doing them. Do not sell anything and don't, do, don't represent yourself without a contract. Because it can, you can take the two greatest people in the world and put them at a table and we can start talking about catfish and I can convince them they're going to catch a blue cat over a channel cat or a flathead. And it's all sometimes unintended, missing, under, understood issues. So if you haven't thought about contracts, please think about them. And in those contracts, by the way, there's one person that gears every single thing almost we do in here. And you know who that is? That's our veterinarians. Have you ever heard the term client-patient relationship? It's the most important thing that we're doing right now with what we do for a living. Because if we lose client-patient relationships... We lose the ability to capture these animals. I work for Wildlife Pharmaceuticals. I help develop BAM, and I deal with DEA issues or aphid or aphis or someone almost weekly about the issue with these drugs. And I will tell you this. Um, you remember the movie Ombre with Paul Newman? Anybody remember that movie? What did he say when he was on the stairway? It's not going to get any easier. It's going to get worse. And the only way that these veterinarians are going to be willing to stay hitched with us is if we keep them protected. If you let your guard down and you take off and you let somebody take off with something you shouldn't have done or you fail to disclose that that animal had a drug to capture it in and that animal gets in the food chain, it's not good, guys. So you have to be aware of that. And, and don't let your guard down, because I, I've already experienced that with other people that have done that. Um, helo operations, this is a favorite topic. You do the LOAs, you're ready to go catch, and the helicopter didn't even have a map knowing where the boundaries were, and you try to school them that morning. Is there any helicopter operators in here? Okay, you love that. So it's really important to know where you're at when you're flying. By the way, it's also state and federal rules to know where you're at, right? So prepare when you're going to use a helicopter. Think about getting him right and make sure that he knows and he's oriented towards that. This is a big deal I've dealt with three times in my career, three times deaths on all-terrain vehicles or issues. Now, all of us have been in here. I'm looking across the crowd, and I recognize a lot of faces in here that have a lot of experience in capture. But you know what happens. The adrenaline gets up. We unload the, the four-wheelers. We get our ground crews ready, and off we go, and somebody gets hurt. And the only reason that we don't get hurt more, have you ever heard the saying, the good Lord protects drunks and somebody else? I don't know how we haven't gotten hurt more than we have. Because a lot of people are subject to get hurt in this business. The crew is everything for us. But what I found out early in my career, the crew wasn't always taught and trained exactly right. And so that's a, that's a meaningless picture, except that it's a beautiful animal that's successfully caught. But by the way, he will bite your fingers off. And probably we... If you noticed in front of him, we were fixing to, 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 to muzzle him, and we hadn't had him muzzle yet, yet because we were getting him on his, on his feet. But I will tell you, if you don't have workman's comp, if you don't have workman's comp and you have a crew, you're flirting with a death warrant. It's tough. I was telling Dr. Durr a while ago, I got my new professional liability bill for what I do for a living, and, and I started at 3000 a year, and now I'm up to almost $800 a month 
just in my professional liability to, to operate, but I can tell you I can't be without it. I can't risk what I have. I can't do it. Know your limits, by the way. And that slide's kind of simple, and, he, and that, that animal was easy to capture. Now what are we going to do with it? So what kind of crew you have? Did you need a come along? Did you need a trailer, a pulley system in your trailer? Uh, did you need a skid? So we try hard to prepare ahead before we start those types of captures because I've seen a lot of times, AKA bison, we get them on the ground, now what are you gonna do with them? And, and well, we got five guys and we'll hook, a, we'll hook a sling up to his head and all of us know not to pull an animal like that by his head. We're going to pull him by the feet so we don't dislocate his neck, right? You'd be surprised at the places I've been where they dislocated him and we had to euthanize him. Now, what in the world would a tattoo be doing on somebody's chest in a wildlife program today? Remember the words perception? I deal every single day almost with people that don't want us to do what we do. And I will tell you, they're in all walks of life. They're at the gas station. They're in the wildlife agencies. They're in governmental positions. They don't understand what we do for a living. And, I, and furthermore, I was talking to a gentleman out in the hall a while ago. I would tell you, disappointingly, they don't want to know sometimes what we do. But it's easy to go home and say, I saw a guy at a gas station, and he was sticking something with a hot shot trying to get him up in the trailer instead of pulling around behind the gas station to do whatever you needed to do. And by the way, people will unlock your doors on your trailers. I see Vic st sitting back there, and I know what he does for a living, and he knows a lot of this stuff about what we have to be cautious of, but I will tell you, I've had my locks and my trailers jimmied with when I walked inside a building to go do something for five minutes and come out the door be unlocked. So just a little tidbit, think about those as you move down the road. So that Tattoo, you remember your dad saying if he's got tattoos or she's got tattoos, he's probably been in jail? That's not true. But people think that sometimes, and they don't know any better. Now, you have to guess if I have any tattoos or not, right? Sharing information. That's always an interesting thing. When we all first got together and we were doing well in this business, we wanted to keep close to us what we did. We wanted to keep our secrets close to us. But what I found out is if I really had somebody that wanted to know something and I didn't tell them and they got out and got in a mess, it was a direct reflection on all of our industry. We can't hurt sharing information with each other. That doesn't mean we give each other our clients, but if we get a chance to take a little bit of time to share some information, like capture, and we all know if any of us leave this room today and think that anesthesia works perfect every time, you haven't been in the business very long, right? The most disappointing thing that happens to all of us so, case in mind, remember the contract? You need to have in there, as a landowner and as a capture specialist, that there's an old sticker you used to see on the back of trucks, and I'll be polite and not say what it said, but stuff happens. Let them know you'll do everything you can, but you can't predict what's going to always happen. Because you know what they're going to say when, as soon as it happens? They're going to do two things. They're going to blame you for it, and they're going to blame the drug for it. I bet I've had 500 calls in the last 10 years that says your drug doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't work all the time because there's all kinds of extenuating circumstances. Does a zebra catch well with BAM? I can tell you no, it doesn't. Can you catch them with BAM? Yes, but it doesn't work all the time. Can you walk them in a trailer? Yes. Can you chase them in a helicopter? But all those things that have to do with where that animal leaves point A and goes to point Z and lives, that's the only time we have success. If it dies, every one of us lose. Every one of us in this room, from people that do magazines, to Brian's sale, to my business, 
we all lose. But what I have found out is no matter what I tell them, no matter what I tell them, they don't understand when we lose an animal. They just don't understand. So what I do now, I don't set foot on a ranch that I don't have a contract spelling it out because I can't be perfect every time. And if you know you can't be perfect, then you're probably going to be successful. And if you don't know something, pick up that phone and answer. I get calls all the time about BAM. I help develop it. I help the dosages. It just won't catch some things right. And you got to know where the limitations are. And I'm, I guess that's one of my pet peeves. I, I should have taken a picture yesterday. I wanted to get it so bad, but I was driving. A guy, there might be somebody in here, so I won't mention a name. He could even be in here. But it was the greatest thing. There was a, some kind of net in the back of the pickup. The springs were out of it. He had a sign on the side of his pickup that says, I'll just say ABC Capture Company. And the trailer had all the wires dragging behind it. And the truck and the trailer looked like this. And he, it was, it was Brian's trucks. It doesn't mean he wasn't successful, but I was thinking to myself, I wonder what happens when he pulls up on the job. You know, people do have a perception of what you do. Um, and you know what else he was doing? He was on his cell phone, probably trying to sell the zebra he had in the back of that trailer. And what happens, you know, you, you have somebody that calls you and says, I need a zebra. I tried to buy one from so-and-so, and they showed up dead. And I just couldn't figure out why he was dead. And he put him in a little bitty compartment where he couldn't turn around. He, he, was doing, he thought he was doing the right thing, but he didn't know. And so one of my messages today is nothing in this business is cheap. But if you think it's expensive... To hire a Yalu to do it, go hire that professional to come back and do it. You get what you pay for. I've heard several programs in here today that really have a lot of merit to them, and one of them is, is a predator control program. These people buy these exotics, and they haven't done any kind of predator control. And lo and behold, guess what happens? We start losing them. It's almost like clockwork. And so, so no, help, help your client understand how to get that ranch ready before you, before you make that move because those are what really hurts. And then you know what he's going to say when they start dying? Well, something's wrong with your animals. And this, this, is, a, this is a really cliche I hear a lot. Mr. Bluncher, uh, would you mind uh, maybe giving us a bid on coming and catching some, something for us? I said, well, tell me a little bit about your ranch. How long you been in the business? What kind of shape are your animals in? My, Pat won always the same answer. My animals are in great shape. Well, that guy right there thought his animals were in good shape. He didn't have a blade of grass. He didn't have, I asked him about his parasite program. He said, oh, I, do, I got a perfect parasite program. About once a year, I spread some parasite pills on the ground. And I take care of them that way. And so they're in good shape. And I said, I can't help you. I, I think I'm going to pass on this job. So remember, the perception of whether that animals are in good shape might be the, in the eyes of the beholder. In relocation, here's where the bridge begins to be built. Because we're never successful unless they make it. And where do you draw the line about when they become the owner's property and they leave your possession, that's where I'm going to go back to that contract again. And if they tell you, I'm not going to sign a contract with you, you better look out. And, and I'll tell you 50% who, gets, who used to get us in trouble, it was their wives because they thought we killed the animals. And so think about the relocation, if, if you don't, and I'm not blaming wives for all this, by the way. So I wanted to touch a little bit on predation, and you had a great program on it, and I talked to the gentleman outside. So where did all my axes go? So that coyote right there weighed 58 pounds. 20 years ago, I would have told you there's no coyotes that big in the state of Texas. So they are. And, and there's a couple of species of animals that are more subject to predation than others. 
and I know them all in my head, and I know what I'm up against. But but that predator question is so important to ask people of how, when, and where, and what part of the country they're in. Because all of these predators now are getting embedded in these community associations, and no one can go in there and catch them. There's a few people that can, but believe me, it's an issue now that wasn't there. And I talked to Dr. Durr about this outside. I'm dealing with, I know every one of you going to laugh when I tell you this. The last week, I've done nothing all day but deal with, guess what? Attacks on humans from wild turkeys. And I don't mean turkeys like me. I mean wild turkeys that are jumping on people because they live in a a different program, a different protection, and what's happened to everything from rats to turkeys to apex predators, now they become programmed, they have no fear of humans. The grizzly bear is a perfect example in Wyoming. They can't hunt them yet. They can defend themselves, but what's happening to them, you go elk hunting now and you pull the trigger, they know in their mind that you just, you just put the, the dinner bell on the table. And we're dealing with this in Texas everywhere. This has been the worst year I have ever had with, with predators with all my work. I've never had it like I've had it this year. It's just one ranch after another. And we, and we have some programs, but we just can't seem to get ahead of them. Do we need to feed our exotics? I think... Uh, we had some gentleman uh, from Ranch Consulting uh, that talked about game plans and business plans. Well, I can tell you that we feed our exotics, and we have a methodology of how we feed them. And it's important to know how to feed them, when to feed them, and where to feed them. And, and I can tell you the difference between uh, a ranch that has a really upbeat feeding program, a good parasite program, and, and instead of a guy that calls you and he's putting a few, quote, um, parasite pills. I never figured out what the pills were, but he, but he knew. So obviously, and how do you feed them? Do you feed them on the ground? Do you feed them in a trough? I'd tell you don't feed them on the ground elementary wise because there's things that can happen. And remember, every single ranch has a thumbprint on it unlike the other ranches. I'll get a call from out of the clear blue sky. It's rained and all of a sudden we're losing some animals. I start asking about historically what was on that ranch before they started putting exotics on it. There's a lot of things out there that can create that. Sheep and goat country. You don't know what was there and what, what comes up after a rain. So when something like that happens, you have to be really wide spectrum to, to look. It's not always parasites. It, it, can be, it can be territorial issues. It can be predators. It can be parasites. It can be lots of things. So, uh, but I can tell you that, you know, the Armageddon we had in, I think it was 21, where we went seven below, 10 below zero. We've never recovered from that yet. I, I just didn't dream it was going to do what it did, but it's affected everything. The grass communities haven't come back right. The trees haven't come back right. I've been here for a long time, and I've never seen it kill mesquite trees. There's a lot of things that are still creeping out there from that, that Armageddon that I never dreamed would happen, and I think some of them we haven't really discovered yet. And the right plan before you get started, you know, this is kind of like a football game. When you're, when you're going in to capture, you're going in to do business, how many do we get down? And, and Joseph Richard's here with these, these traps outside here, or his guys are. When can you use them and when do you use a helicopter? And how do you convince or how do you talk to a landowner about what method you use before you contract with him? It's vitally important because that shows them that you've got options and you're, you're exercising every option you can before you help them. And remember, the best laid plans of men and mice don't always go perfect. And you can drop that trap sometime and before you can get there, you can lose some of those animals. Let him know that. It's important. Um, the setup, I used to not think this, but when I'm trapping now or we're doing something or I'm advising people that are catching um, animals or exotics or whatever, it is important where you set those traps and how you design where they're going. Those things are smart and they have different, they just don't roam around at will for no reason at all. You know, the guy that was in here on the predator program when, 
and, and I'm getting calls constantly, and I don't have time to do it, about helping people with predator problems. But when I go on a ranch, I'm looking immediately. I just don't go out there and say, set a trap there. And I do the same thing with my traps now in my exotic business. I look at that ranch before I decide where we're going to operate. And if we're going to have a helicopter, I try to help them look at logistics of how long it's going to take us to fly the ranch and what are the chances of success if we fly those ranches to catch that particular species. Because you know some of these ranches, you've got about a 10% chance to catch some of those animals, and then they're in the canyons, and they will not come out. They just won't. So you have to have several options sometimes. So some of those plans are, are, are multi-option planned, and I don't set foot on them without a contract again. I know you're going to hear me say that a bunch, but I mean it. That says the perfect description, and I put that guy in there for a reason. You ever heard the term uh, white buffalo? So the guy calls. He says, you got a white buffalo? I need one. I got one. Well, he's white, right? No, he's not white. He's cream-colored. Well, I didn't buy a cream-colored buffalo. You told me he was white. So photographs prior to going in, and I know you're shaking your heads because some of you have been down this road, right? I know. And, and the worst thing in the world is to show up at that gate and they try to hedge on you or try to change their mind on you. And guess who are the worst people in the world to change their mind? Now, you think I'm going to tell you who that is. I can tell you exactly who it is. It's humans. They change their mind all the time because they're seeing all different things. I was sitting at this table a while ago, and I walked in, and those guys in that back table made me mad. I had an emblem on. I had my chest stuck out. And they didn't pay one bit of attention to me. And a girl walked in in a short skirt a while ago, and all of them's eyes went right across the room. I'm going to wear a skirt next time. That'll really turn your head. So remember, if you're describing, hey, if you think he's a two-year-old and he's really a three-year-old, give him the benefit of the doubt. If, if you sell an axis buck and he's a mature animal and he's got velvet coming out, cut it under a little bit. Because you're, if you're right, it's always going to pay dividends to you. They're going to call you back again. But if you say, oh, he's a six-year-old, he's probably going to be 36 inches, and he comes out 25 inches and he's really a three-year-old, you're going to get in trouble. Because I hear that all the time. He told me they were six years old and they're really not. And that, and that, and that buffalo is a prime example. That's a, that's a blonde buffalo, not a white buffalo. By the way, you know what I don't like about that buffalo? Anybody see it? I don't like his horns. Um, water gaps, the Achilles tendon of every ranch. How secure is your ranch? Oh, it's real secure. Nothing can get out. Do you have any water gaps? Yeah, I got one. It's about 500 yards long. How well is it built? Oh, we built it good. My, my, my welder built it. But I will share this with you. This is one of the most successful water gaps that I've ever I wish I could tell you I designed it, but, but don't think about this one. But that is um, conveyor belt, and it flexes and moves, and timber will go through it. Because what takes those water gaps down? I know Bill's back there shaking his head at me because we had a discussion on his ranch about a water gap. But the timber and debris is what brings the fences down. So the key to knowing about water gaps is knowing about the ebb and flow of those streams. And go look at the, go look at the drift line. If you're building a fence or going to put in a pen, try to get away from those water gaps if you can because they're nothing but trouble. Uh, water sources. Obviously, you know, I, I'm not going to belabor much on this because I think everybody in here knows how, how important it is to have even distribution. So I'm going to tell you a story. Just happened to me. You got water, you got good water distribution before I bring you your animals? Yes, sir. I just bought the ranch. Now, we got good water, right? I should have said, how are the locations? So we get ready to catch. We get them in the trailer and we're on the way. And I think, I'm going to ask him one more time, how's your water situation? He said, I got one really good trough activated. And we got 800 acres. So, and we're in a drought, by the way. Any of you seen the NOAA weather reports for Central Texas? They're not good. 
They're not good, guys. I told my wife last night, I know it's my college days haunting me, but it keeps going around our ranch every day. Um, oh, man. Y'all want to talk about this? So I put that in there for a reason. I, I spend at least one, one day, two days a month in Austin talking about CWD. So I wished that we had a little more time to talk about how it can influence you. But there's some animals out there that are suspect that haven't been proven yet, but there are animals that they found it in that we deal with. If you don't know the regulations about going in and catching red deer, psyca, those type of animals, you better ask somebody because they won't give you a second chance if you make a mistake now. There's permits to be done. There's site IDs to establish. There's RFID tags to be implemented. And if you don't do it and it comes back on you, it's going to affect two people. It's going to affect you and that landowner that didn't know that thought you should have told him. So if you get ready to go in and you're doing a liquidation on an estate like we do, Vic does sometimes, you better ask about what species you expect us to catch out of there and what species occur on that ranch. Because some of them go outside the livestock issues and go into CWD issues, which the Texas Animal Health Commission controls. Now, I don't want to be the barriers of bad burden, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of what's coming down the pike. You can look at the susceptible species. You know what that is. That psycho red deer, their hybrids, uh, moose, some of those animals, that after May you're going to be expected to test every one of your mortalities. Now, I know that a lot of you were at the EWA meeting, and, and we were all there talking about this, but it's gone past that now. So it's going to be implemented because it's lopsided, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, they're going to rectify it. And the first thing that you're going to see is that if those animals die, they're mandatorily going to have to be tested. Now, if you catch them, and you, and you lose one in capture, you better decide before you get in there who's going to be responsible for that because if that landowner tells you, just go pull it in the back of the property and it comes back to haunt you, you know who's going to get the blame for it. So you you got to, here's the message, you've got a couple of months, well, we're in May, we don't have long, but right now it's a maximum of three, minimum of one, and there's inventories on them. So if you've got some that you're going to be moving, you've got to get on the stick because in the future, every mortality on those susceptible animals have got to be tested. And by the way, I'm not taking sides. I'm just telling you how it is. They're looking hard at axis deer right now because they believe the genomic makeup of axis deer could be a precursor to having CWD in that species of animal. So I don't know where that's going to go, but I can tell you it's being looked at. And there's a project right now that, that may be implemented in Ames, Iowa, uh, that will be testing for susceptibility of CWD with axis deer. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. Um, and there's my pet peeve right there, social media. And look, guys. I love this business and I love what we do and never did I dream that I would ever be able to do this for a living like you're doing and I'm doing and Brian and all of his people are getting to do. But there are people that want, they, there are people that hate this and they may be sitting in this room right now watching what we're doing and that's why when we do a presentation or we're out there working, the days of being uh, one of the good old boys are kind of over now because it'll come back to get us. And if you decide because you had a successful capture that day that you're going to post something on social media, you're not helping us. You're hurting us if you don't do it right. And I see it all the time. And I'm telling you, it's hurting us. And you've got to believe me, it's hurting us. So if you do an ad or you take a picture and you show to somebody, it's amazing the venues that I'm in that I'm talking to people and I don't know their attitudes about this business. And later on, I get a phone call from them. 
So, so take care of how you post anything. I don't use it because I don't like what people do to us. But I'm proud we do it, and it's viable to the state of Texas, but there are people out there that don't want us to do it. And I put that in there for a reason. You better read that. Can y'all read it? Ranchers should prepare now for FDA changes. I've got some in my back pocket, but I don't have time to discuss them with you. But we're looking at changes because of interpretation of certain animals and what it's going to take to make you now disclose that you put a drug in those animals. I wish I had the time to do it, but I'll be here for a little while. We're right on the cusp of having to do some things we've never done before. And I wish I could tell you it's not coming, but it is. But please, if you're using capture drugs, I don't care if you handwrite it on your receipt. You better put in there that that animal does not need to be consumed from the guidance of your veterinarian for X number of days. You better put it on there. I'm warning you. And I believe this may be my last slide. And the reason I put that in there, uh, that's a harsh crippler cactus. And most people will cuss that cactus. I think it's kind of pretty. And what I'm telling you today, my message at the end, is the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You get what you pay for. And it's amazing to me a guy can go buy a $10 million ranch and go hire a guy for $150 to catch his kudu. Beyond my comprehension. So my message to you today, we're in a changing world, and if we're going to keep this business good and Bible and above board, we're going to have to do some things we probably don't want to do, and we're going to have to join hands and do them, and we're going to have to represent our industry, but we got to do it right. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I do love this business, and I love you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Warren. So, um, there you go. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so, you know, one of the things that I would encourage you all to do is that um, Warren is deeply involved in the regulatory side um, of our industry, and there is a lot going on from a regulatory standpoint. Um, <clears throat> I guess it's been about 90 days or so ago. Um, two of our employees were driving down the road. Um, they had um, legally prescribed BAM, uh, which is a drug that we use for capture in the truck. Um, they were pulled over by a game warden and a DPS officer. I think it was about 9.30 at night, something like that. Um, these are two really young guys. They're, they're not gonna stand their ground about not searching a vehicle. They conceded to let the officer search the vehicle, told them about the BAM, and the long and the short of it is, is that the the uh, game warden confiscated uh, it was about five thousand dollars worth of worth of capture drug, and I'm not the kind of person that's just going to turn a blind eye to that. I'm going to defend our employees, and I, I'm going to investigate and find out what the law is. The long the long and the short of it is, is that what was communicated to me by the game warden is that they are in fact focusing on our industry. And the, the reason they are is because there are so many people jumping into this that they're chasing the money because it's easy money to make, make money catching, buying, catching, and flipping animals. And so you've got lots of guys running around with prescription drugs without a legal prescription. And it's getting to be a really significant concern for public safety because of things like what Warren said where people are catching animals with drugs and then somebody may eat that animal. Or for that matter, what, what, what's going to happen when some 25-year-old kid who's screwing around darts his buddy in the butt and the guy ends up dead, you know? And I'm sure you guys never did anything stupid when you were in your 20s, but I did some stupid stuff that goes beyond that. And so these are risks that are facing our industry right now. And it would be very naive of us to think that the government is not watching because they are. They are watching and they are implementing um, actions to address these concerns. 
And the problem is, is that these, these behaviors and these things that we're doing that we've taken for granted for so long is no big deal. They have the capability of shutting everybody down. And he talked a little bit about the client patient relationship between the veterinarian and a landowner. And the minute that veterinarians stop prescribing these drugs to us for us to go catch our own animals is the day that everything in this whole industry comes to a screeching halt and it gets really difficult. It doesn't mean it won't continue. It just means it gets really, really difficult. So I would encourage you, grab Warren after this, ask him questions, talk to him. He can tell you a lot about what, what goes on with Parks and Wildlife, a lot about what's going on with uh, their ability to regulate our industry. And if you would have asked me a year ago whether Parks and Wildlife could regulate the exotic industry, I would have told you no. But the truth is, is that anytime you have a dart gun in your hand, you're hunting by definition of the law. And as the result of that, the minute that they say you can no longer hunt with a tranquilizer gun, we're done. Uh, and I mean done, like we're done. It, 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 it goes back to the helicopter and the net gun, which makes it very difficult to catch animals safely and without a lot of death loss. And so I, I just encourage you to get informed, get information, find out about the regulatory environment, because for anybody that's been, business, been in business for a long enough period of time, you have seen government regulation shut down industries, and it happens overnight. When government makes a, a significant change or a law to a particular industry, it can be catastrophic instantaneously. I, I'll, use, I'll use the telemarketing industry as an example, since I know everybody loves telemarketers. Um, I happen to be a glorified telemarketer. And so um, back in the 90s, it was customary that you would call people at home and you'd give them a pitch and try to sell them something. And uh, there was this law called the do not call list that got enacted. And here in San Antonio, we had a company called West Telemarketing. I think they employed about 5,000 people. With that law, it was a matter of months before they were essentially gone. They didn't even exist. And so if you think that government regulation cannot affect our industry, you're a boy whistling in the dark because I'm telling you it absolutely can happen and it is very likely to happen if we don't start paying attention to our own behaviors and the way that we're approaching our industry and to not be careless and instead to be thoughtful, but more importantly, to be proactive. We, we have a voice and the government's willing to hear us. We, we do have the capability of giving some input into what it is that happens. But if we think that they're not going to create regulations around what we do, uh, we're, we're kidding ourselves. And, and Warren mentioned, it is coming. And I'm telling you, it's not just coming, it is here. It's here now. And if we don't, if we don't take a, a strong position of communicating our voice loudly, and I would encourage all of you, I've taken an active, uh, I've taken an active role in showing up uh, for the EWA, the Exotic Wildlife Association. They have a board meeting coming up, I think, next week. Um, this is the organization that represents our industry to government agencies and, and other things. And so they are our voice, and they've been around for a very, very long time. And it, it is in our interest that that, that organization um, succeeds in carrying our mission forward. And so if you have input to offer, I would encourage you to go to the board meeting, give your input, talk about the things that are important to you because they, they are willing to move forward and, and fight these fights, but we've got to get behind them and we've got to push them and we've got to encourage them about the things that are important to us. So please grab Warren and ask questions. This is a really important part of what we do.